Go with me to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. Before we receive our evening tithes and offering, I want to share the word with you so that our giving is always based on the word. Now, this is a very powerful statement here in Proverbs, the 13th chapter, verse 22, where it says, the wealth of the sinner or the wealth of the wicked, which is the world. Amen. The wealth of the wicked is stored up, laid up or stored up for the righteous. Amen. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. See, the wicked are not going to be able to leave an inheritance to their children's children because it's laid up for the righteous, to stored up for the righteous. And the wealth of the sinner finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up. See, it is impossible for you to serve God, be righteous, and not be blessed. Amen? God will bless the righteous. David said, I've been young, I've been old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. How many are parents in this place? You are parents. Listen, you, when you live a righteous life, there's a blessing that flows from you to the generations. There's a generational blessing. There's a generational wealth. See, God is all about generational wealth. Even when he called Abram before he was even Abraham, and he promised him a blessing, right? He said, I will bless you, but it didn't stop there. But through your seed, I'll bless your seed, and through your seed will come a great nation that I will bless, and through your seed, I will bless all the nations. Amen. See, it's talking about generational blessing. Generational blessing. The curse is to four generations, but the blessing is to a thousand generations. And do you realize that we have not had a thousand generations here on the planet? We do not have a thousand generations. There will not be a thousand generations by the time Jesus comes back. That means the blessing never ends. If a generation is 40 years, that's 40,000 years. We've only had 6,000 years since Adam. Amen. Hallelujah. So the blessing never runs out. The blessing never runs out. I said the blessing never runs out. That's why you, you, you should be happy when you see people get blessed because the blessing never runs out. Same place that blessing came from, there's blessing for you. If you will serve God, amen, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. See, the world has been storing up wealth and possessions because that's their focus. That's their priority. The heathens seek after these things, which is based on greed, storing up selfishly and robbing God. Imagine how much has been robbed from God. In all these generations, how much has been robbed from God? And the thief is found, it shall restore back sevenfold. All, it's got, all of it, see, think about Think about the Hebrews. They were in slavery for 400 years, built the wealth of Egypt, and God overnight transferred the wealth of Egypt into their hands. So we have examples of this in the Bible, of wealth transfer, overnight, supernatural. Hallelujah. Bible says God gave them favor, and they went and stripped the Egyptians of all their wealth because the women went and asked for all of it. So they didn't actually rob them at gunpoint. They had favor, and because of God's favor, the wealth was transferred into their hands. They gave willingly. said, just take this and go. Hallelujah. So there is going to be a supernatural divine wealth transfer in these last days. Thank you for the two yeses. You know why? Because the world does not honor God by giving, and thousands of years of stolen tithes and offerings will come back to the kingdom of God because it's all God's. And it'll come to, through, to righteous people so that it can come through righteous people who will use it to honor God. 
Go with me to Ecclesiastes, the second chapter. Ecclesiastes, the third of the wisdom books. If you need wisdom, read the book of Psalms, which is poetry, and read the book of Proverbs, and read Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verse 26, and I'll read from the Amplified. For to the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. That means we must be pleasing God here because we get a lot of joy. I believe in what we're doing. I believe in joy as much as I believe in wisdom and knowledge and joy. Who likes wisdom? Who likes knowledge? Who likes joy? You need all three. Because I've seen some people knowledgeable but looking miserable. <laughs> Amen. So to the person who pleases God or him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner... He gives the work of gathering and heaping up that he may give it to the one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind and a feeding on it. So people that are just striving, it's vanity. Because they're chasing after vain things. Vain things. But we're not going after something vain. We're going after something that's eternal and holy, and pure, and righteous, and good. So let them heap it up. Because they're doing it for you. Let them keep storing up. Because they're storing it up for us. Amen. They get to do the work of gathering and heaping up. We get to do the work of honoring God and whatever they gather and heap up comes back to us. It will eventually find its way into the hand of the righteous. So there's a prophesied end time harvest we find in the word of God, the word of God and that's in Haggai chapter 2. So go with me to Haggai. The second chapter. Read from verse 6 through 9. I'll read the um, Amplified. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a, little in a little while, I will shake and make tremble the starry heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. I tell you all the time, when there's a shaking, we should rejoice. You know what happens during a time of shaking? Things change place. Wealth transfer happens in times of shaking. And that's basically actually how the evil elite, the global elite, dispossess the nations of their wealth by shaking the nations and then they take they steal that's why they love war they love war they love chaos order out of chaos is their motto you understand me that's why they love to come and shake things up in an evil way but god is going to step in and shake things up this is god doing the shaking amen this is god himself doing the shaking shaking what the heavens the earth, the sea, the dry land, and all nations. That means America will be shaken by the glory of God. All means all. That includes all 50 states of the United States of America and all the territories will be shaken by the mighty hand of God. This is a prophecy about the last days. And the desire and the precious things of all nations shall come in. What are the desire and what are the precious things? Another translation says that the treasure of all nations shall come in. Hallelujah. 
the desire and the precious things or the treasures of all nations shall come in. I will fill this house with splendor or glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house with a successor to which Jesus came, that's us. We are the latter house. Shall be greater than the former. And I shared about Solomon's temple this morning. The offerings that were taken up in 1 Corinthians chapter 29 totals over $10 billion today. 10 to 15 billion in today's value of the offering that was taken up for Solomon's temple. And it was such a glorious building that other kings and queens would come and see and become speechless. When the queen of Ethiopia, the queen of Sheba came, the Bible says, I had heard of it by my ears, but now that I have seen it, the Hebrew says, the breath left her. And that was the glory of the former temple. We are now the latter temple, the latter house. Amen. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. Amen. And in this place, I will give peace and prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. So this is what's going to happen in the last days. Because once more, yet one more time, I will shake the heavens, the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. When I shake all nations, the desire and the precious things and the treasures of all the nations shall come in to the house that I will fill with glory. That's why you must be filled with glory. A righteous man, a righteous woman is a man or a woman who's filled with the glory of God. And the glory of the latter temple, which is you and I, shall be greater than the glory of the former temple. So we should be talking billions, not millions. It says, in this place, I will give peace and prosperity. You need to meditate on these things. And I'm just going to tell you right now, back in 2010, I had a, a, a really significant encounter with the Lord one of many encounters but this was a very significant one because i was in a time of fasting and prayer you know coming into 2010 um i had got the word that 2010 this is back when i was pastoring in istanbul turkey and going to the nations before i even came here to west palm beach in 2017 so this is now 14 com coming up almost 15 years ago and the word of the lord for 2010 was it's going to be a year of revelation so I had shared that with the church. You know, this is going to be a year of revelation. And little did I know what was about to happen to me. But of course, if I'm going to give a word, I'm going to press in for it myself. It's not just for the people. It's for me. I got to take a hold of it myself. I got to press in for it myself. Amen. Because if I don't press in, a lot of pastors are like, you know, let the people press in. But they're not pressing in. You know, I got to be the one pressing in. So I went into a time of fasting and prayer. And I shared this when I came. You, you interpreted for me 2000 and. 15, um, the December conference in Kiev, Ukraine at Victory Church with Apostle Henry Madawa. You were my interpreter back then. And I shared this and Pastor Henry comes in and he was, we were in the green room. because I've never heard this before in my life. Because here's what happened to me. So I, in the time of fasting and prayer, I was crying. I mean, I knew a lot of things. I had been studying, especially eschatology is like a real passion of mine. And when I got saved right, up, right away out of Islam, I mean, eschatology was something I was very, very interested in, you know, because there's a whole different eschatology in the Islamic religion, right? They believe that Jesus is actually going to come back as the, the Mahdi, and then he's going to establish Islam as the world religion. And that's the teaching and all this other stuff, right? So eschatology was a real passion of mine, and I studied it all the time. But in 2010, and I had just finished doing a, a television series uh, uh, TV programs for the Christian network on eschatology, just going through this. So I, it was just something that was burning in my spirit. And then I knew a lot of different pieces, but there was just something that didn't connect everything. 
and I was crying out to the Lord. I mean, I see what's going on in the geopo geopolitical realm and, and everything, and I was just really pressing in. And so I went to bed one night in this time of fasting and praying, and in the middle of the night, probably around 3.30 or 4 a.m., I woke up like out of just, I just woke up and stood in bed. I just woke up and stood in bed, and I heard an audible voice of the Lord. The Lord spoke to me. I heard the audible voice of the Lord said money changers money changers i heard the audible voice of the lord money changers and it was almost like you know somebody just standing by my bedside and said money changers and i looked over pastor rose's sound asleep she heard nothing i knew the lord spoke because i've heard the audible voice of the lord i heard the audible voice of the lord when i was 17 years old so i knew it was an audible voice of the lord so i got up I was so waken up so strongly by the Holy Ghost. I got up and I went to my study and I sat down and I knew instantly the story of the money changers. So I went to the story of the money changers. It's in all four of the gospels. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic gospels. That means they're very similar. John is not one of the synoptic, synoptic gospels, so it's a little different, the story. But the story is basically, remember as Jesus he, he made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, right? They're all crying out, you know, if, you, if they don't shout, the very rocks and stones are going to cry out, you know, so the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, he comes in, right? And the very next day, he goes to the temple, right? It's the week of Passover, so it's the time of gathering. Everybody's coming in, right, from all around because the Passover was a time of gathering. All the Jews had to come to Jerusalem because that's where they came to worship. That's where the temple was. That's where God's presence was. So God's presence didn't go to them. They had to come to God's presence. Thank God now that God's presence comes to us wherever we are. That's why we are the latter house. It's all better. It's, it's the glory of the latter house is much greater than the glory of the former house. So Jesus goes into the temple and you know the money changers are there and they have set up their tables right and they're doing what they're exchanging money coins and they're buying and selling in the temple courtyard the temple courtyard where they were operating was called the court of the gentiles this was the place where everybody could come and it was supposed to be the place of evangelism for the strangers to become proselyte Jews. They could actually become a proselyte. A foreigner, a stranger could come and actually convert and be proselytized. Do you understand me? And it was supposed to be a place of evangelism. It was supposed to be a place of where God would be displayed to them, where they would see and hear the word of God. But if you walked in, all they were doing was merchandising. And Jesus, I mean, we see a level of anger, a righteous indignation that was never displayed before. I mean, he had run-ins with the religious people. He rebuked them, you brood of vipers, and he, you know, you, you know, you whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones and woe unto you. And he, you know, he rebuked them and everything. But this time, he doesn't just rebuke them. He literally goes in there and he gets physically violent he takes those tables and starts overthrowing the money changers tables throwing everything around and he, he he makes whips and he starts whipping people he literally whips the money changers right and he says my house is to be a house of prayer but you've turned it into a house or a den of thieves so he calls them thieves right instead of a prayer for all nations a house of prayer for all nations you've turned it into a den of thieves you are thieves you're merchandising you are you are liars and you are thieves and he starts he just runs through the place like a storm and just just destroys their operation overturns their operation interrupts their operation and i'm reading the story and i've read it before i preached on it a few times you know and i preached on it you know in a sense which is what you you hear a lot of people preaching on the common sense you know oh you turn the church into a den of thieves and you're merchandising and you you're the money changer. You know, even for receiving offerings and teaching on this, I've been accused of being a money changer. You know, that's not what that story is about. You don't have no clue. And as I'm reading this, like scales fell off of my eyes, and I could see. And the Lord spoke to me. 
He said, the money changers are the bankers. And there is a system that is established. Not the, the same exact system back then continues today. Now remember, the money changers and the Pharisees worked together. Because I'll come to that story. Because I really feel to share on this tonight. Is this okay? I haven't shared on this in a long time. And I'll only share on it when I feel the anointing. And I really feel the anointing because of what we're about to see happen not only in America, but across the, the nations. And I'll go to some other scriptures. But so, and I begin to see like scales fell off of my eyes. And the Lord spoke to me. The same audible voice spoke to me. He said, one more time, I will step in and I will overturn the money changers tables in these last days. And there will be a great wealth transferred from the hands of the wicked into the hands of the righteous and it'll be a quick work i shall do a quick work and i will empower my church financially and accelerate my church financially to do a supernatural and a quick work to evangelize the nations i heard it and then the lord spoke to me he said i want you to study banking the history of money the history of banking money creation and I'll show you everything. And then, of course, as I begin to study, and I went on a study for the next year, because this happened sometime in early February, the, the rest of 2010, hundreds and hundreds of hours of just study and research, study and research, and prayerfully. Because you got to really pray, because there's a lot of other weird information out there too. But you got the unction, right? You got the Holy One. You got an anointing from the Holy One. You know all things, and He will show you. He's the Spirit of Truth. So... He began to show me, you know, what was crazy and what was true, what was true. And a lot of the stuff that, you know, people go around, you crazy conspiracy theorists. It's actually, it's true. It's true. And we've actually run out of conspiracy theories because they've all come to pass, right? But, you know, but, and I begin to study and the Lord began to show me. So the money changers, as I studied it out, money changers were actually the most powerful sect. They were more powerful than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They actually ran the Sanhedrin because of the power of money. How do you think they get in the temple courtyard and set up shop and operate safely there? They had to be paying somebody off. So the money changers were actually a banking cartel. A cabal, a conglomerate, a banking cartel, right? And they figured out that if they could work together and monopolize the establishment of the money exchange that they could actually drive up the prices because when you have a monopoly that you can just drive up the prices when you're the only source everybody has to come to you right and so you have a monopoly you have a control so they were actually the more more powerful say they were more powerful than the pharisees and the sadducees now, remember there's a um verse that says the sadducees who loved money right love of money is the root of all evil so when you trace it then i begin to look at everything from money war look at the money pandemic look at the money political scene look at the money you always go to the money you always go to money answers all things that's what it says in ecclesiastes you always trace the money i don't care what they're saying and on cnn and you know and uh, BSNBC and, and I, I don't care what they're saying it, it, it just go to the money I don't care what they're saying from the the, the 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 press briefings and just always go to the money you'll see the real root of everything because it's all driven by money money is the anointing of the wicked system it's the power money is the power in the world money is the power isn't it Money is, they even say it, money is power. That's why they're more power hungry and they're more money hungry. It's all about the money. Right? Money is their anointing in the natural. Money is their power. Our anointing is the Holy Ghost anointing and the power of the Spirit in the supernatural. And our currency is faith. But their currency is dollars and euros and every, everything else. So as I begin to study everything, I begin to find out basically, you know, what the whole banking system is about and the history of money, where money comes from, you know, and because, you know, if you look at it, if you think about it, well, let's just go back to the garden. When God blessed Adam and Eve, right, he blessed them, 
Genesis 1, 28, bless them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. And verse 29, behold, I have opened a bank account for you and deposited a billion dollars in it. For you it shall be for provision. No, absolutely not. There was no such thing as money. That was God's creation and there was the power of seed. And this seed for you shall be food. And he seeded the garden. He placed him there, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. So now he has the blessing, the power, the anointing on the inside of him. And he is to take this garden of Eden and cultivate it and fill the whole earth with it. The whole earth was to be, become the garden of Eden. To be multiplied and to increase. Garden of Eden was in a specific location, but it was to, to be replicated and duplicated and to replenish the earth. That's why the devil came and attacked it. The devil has always been after the prosperity. He's always been after the prosperity because what happened once they fell, they got kicked out of the garden and the curse of poverty came upon mankind, which is represented in thorns and thistles. And that's why Jesus wore the crown of thorns. That is the curse of poverty. So the money system that we are dealing with in the world today is the wicked money. What the Bible calls the wicked wealth is the money wealth. Because this money is not based on gold or silver. It's not based on any commodity. It used to be, but it no longer is. Even in the United States Constitution, it was Congress that had the legal authority to coin money with gold and silver. It is in the United States Constitution. But what we have right now is an illegitimate system. What we call today the Federal Reserve, it's not federal and it has no reserves. It's a play on words. It's actually the third central bank of the United States. There were two other central banks prior to this, the first central bank and the second central bank. They were chartered for 20 years and they were both shut down. And after they were both shut down, we had wars. And this, the history is way too long for me to get into tonight, but eventually, the money changers, which are the bankers, came together in 1913. They met in a place called Jekyll Island, Georgia. You know, the devil went down to Georgia. And we know, they, we know the names of, the, of these money changers, the bankers, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, Kuhn and Loeb, Jacob Schiff, okay, and then Paul Warburg, these were the five Jewish money banking families that pretty much ran the banking system. They had already gained control of the European banking system through the Bank of England, Bank of France, the Rothschilds, and these, you know, they were already, and they started wars and funded both sides of the wars and built up all their wealth and began to control the money wealth. See, a lot of people think that government prints money. Government doesn't print money. Government doesn't create money. Banks create money. Every time you go take out a loan, money is created. They loan you money they don't have and charge you interest on the money they gave you that they didn't have. Because we have something called fractional reserve banking. And actually, at the, at the last crash of 2007, there were some banks that were loaning out up to 87 times what they had in reserve, okay? So these bankers, Paul Warburg actually wrote the entire Federal Reserve law, wrote and handed it to Senator Aldridge, who was a United States Senator who was, his daughter was married into the Morgan family. So he went to Congress and the Federal Reserve Act was passed and it was signed by the president that they had funded, who was the president of Princeton University, Woodrow Wilson. And so he had resigned as the president of um, Princeton University and he was funded by the bankers, became the Democratic nominee and the president of the United States. And he signed the Federal Reserve Act into law on Christmas Eve, while everybody is, you know, completely under the mistletoe, you know. But on his deathbed, Woodrow Wilson said, what have I done? I have ruined my country. He sold us out. And the bankers gained control of the economy and the funding and the, and the money system of the United States through the Federal Reserve Bank, which is a private bank. It is a corporation with shareholders. It is a business. 
The only purpose of a business is to what? Make profit. Make more money. And then they established the Corporation of the United States. And they established, and of course, right after that, guess what happened? The federal income tax came. Because you have to have, there was no federal income tax until the Federal Reserve was established. And so the federal income tax became how the Federal Reserve was funded. Our federal income tax, income, you know, tax money does not go to support federal projects. 97% of it goes straight to fund the Federal Reserve, which has never been audited. It was chartered for 20 years. The charter has already run out. And the one president who, who signed an executive order to audit it, John F. Kennedy Jr. was put in an open convertible and driven right in front of people's eyes in the middle of Dallas-Fort Worth and shot to death in front of the whole nation to let you know you don't touch the money. So let me tell you right now, and the Lord spoke to me. Remember, for three and a half years, they, they, they fought with Jesus. The religious leaders, they fought with Jesus. They fought with Jesus. But it was when he finally came in and touched the money, the money changers and the Pharisees had a meeting to kill him. And they took 30 pieces of silver from the temple money changer treasury and paid off Judas Iscariot to sell him out. The same exact scheme still goes on today. People are bought and sold to betray one another so that the money can be protected. That's what we're dealing with. That's what this election is, is about. That's what every one of these elections have been about. We think there's an election, but it's just a selection. And I had to repent for some of the people I voted for. I voted for George Bush Jr. Against John Kerry. They ran against each other. One is Republican, the other one's a Democrat. Two heads of the same snake. They were blood brothers in skull and bones at Yale. High level Illuminati, occult practitioners. That's why George Bush Sr. made a speech on September 11th, 1991, talking about the thousand points of light, the senior and the new world order. And you've heard him talking about, the new, how many of you heard new world order, new world order? I mean, there's so many of them, they speak about it. Everybody, Obama spoke about it, the Clintons spoke about it, all the presidents, they spoke about it. That's why when you see Obama, Bush and Clinton all together in a picture, you don't see Trump there because he's not an insider with those guys. He was a self-made millionaire. He ran on his own money. He wasn't bought and sold by the money changers. That's why they took him. They always want to take him down. Now, I mean, I'm telling you right now. What I'm telling you right now is 100% by the Holy Ghost. It's not some theory. That's why they're trying to assassinate him. That's why they've been trying to assassinate him. Do you understand? Because it's not about politics. It's really about the money. Why do you think we have billions and billions of dollars being sent to other countries where they won't even do, lift a finger to help the people in North Carolina? Families are going to get $750. FEMA has already spent $1.2 billion on illegal immigration in the United States and the budget has run out. There's no money for the American people because they don't care about the American people because they don't work for the American people. They work for the interest of the money changers. Now you see me getting all angry. You're getting angry, aren't you? Now you feel what Jesus for that. Well, that's why he made a whip and whipped them. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, in the last days, I will step in one more time. I will overturn the money changers tables. What does that mean? I will overturn the system. I'll shake the system up. Right? So... Initially, of course, we had gold and silver in the reserves. I have a whole bunch of old money. Silverbacks, goldbacks. How many of you ever seen them? Silverbacks, goldbacks. It's called silver certificate. It said United States dollar on it. I wish I had them with me. I don't because I didn't think I was going to preach this tonight. They're in my safe. I got a whole bunch of them. I got a 20. I got a 50. I got a $1. These are like from 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. Silver, it says silver certificate and the actual number on the money, the serial number actually corresponded to the silver coin in the treasury. It was the people's money. It was the wealth of the nation. It was the people's wealth. 
the gold certificate the same way. It didn't say Federal Reserve note on it. It said United States dollar silver certificate or gold certificate. So in 1913, everything began to shift. And then they brought in a precursor of the New World Order, which is what's called the New Deal. They crashed the markets in 1929, right? Black Tuesday, Black Friday, whatever it was called. Uh, and, you know, and we went into what? The Great Depression. And FDR, their guy, right? They made the laws and the American people were forced to sell all their dollars to the government. They went from house to house confiscating dollars and they paid them $11 per ounce. And all the money was taken out and put in, you know, everybody thinks there's gold at Fort Knox, right? All these places, there's no gold in Fort Knox anymore, but it was taken, it was confiscated from the people. It was stolen from the people through an act of wickedness in a time of shaking that they created. So all these shakings in the market are created. They're not random. They're orchestrated by the banking system, the banking cartels, because we have something called the central banking system. These are private banks. Every central bank is a private bank and they're all tied to the one bank in Basel, Switzerland, the international um, you know, bank of settlements, and then the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, they're all part of this. So basically there's one central banking for the world and then there's all these central banks in the nations. Let me tell you what happened in Libya. Why do you think they overthrew Gaddafi? Because he was getting all the gold, putting it in reserve and trying to get the African nations to have their own money system based on the gold reserves. And they went in there and shot him like a dog on the streets. And, they, and then guess what happened? Next year, Libyan Central Bank tied to the central banking system. So there's still a few nations who are not tied to the central banking system. That's where we have all the wars. So all these wars are actually about the money. They're not ethnic wars. They're not national wars. They're all, they're all wars about money. Or they're wars that are created so they can suck more money out of each nation and bring them, tie them into the central banking system where the same people that can control the banking and the money. So in the time of Jesus, these money changers actually coined money. So we can also call them money creators. They had the shekel. They called it the half shekel silver coin of the temple. The shekel that Peter found in the fish's mouth was the same exact shekel that the money changers coined and had a monopoly had a control of the only way to get it would be to go to the money changers but when they came to collect the tax right matthew 17 when they came to collect the tax they asked peter do you pay and does your master pay the temple tax now it was an illegal tax because if it was a legal tax under the law, Jesus would have obeyed because he fulfilled the law perfectly. He would have already paid it, but it was an illegal tax. See, this temple tax, the tribute tax was established by Moses to, for the upkeep of the temple. And it was only to be collected at every census. When they would count all the cents in the census, every male that was 20 years or older would have to pay a half shekel silver to redeem their soul. It was a money of redemption. Shekel is a weight. So half shekel let's say like a half pound, right? Or a half ounce. They would have to pay this money and the money would be collected and it was for the upkeep of the temple. But by the time of Jesus, the Pharisees, which was the government, if you think about it, religion and political together, and the money changers, which was the money cartel, the cabal, they worked together to establish this tax to be collected every year. That's why they're coming asking Peter for the money and Jesus said, we are exempt. In other words, this is not something we are to be paying. Amen. If it was lawful, Jesus would have already paid it, right? Because he fulfilled the law perfectly. The only thing Jesus would oppose would be something that is unlawful, that is contrary to the word of God, because he is the word of God in the flesh. So it was man's law, not God's law. So Jesus says, you know what though? lest we offend them or give them a reason to arrest us and, and, and basically harass us, go catch a fish. Put down one hook. First fish you catch, open its mouth, you'll find one shekel. Go pay your half shekel and go pay my half shekel. 
and get them off our backs because I don't need to deal with this. So here's what Jesus could have said to Peter. Peter, you know that shekel we need? It's worth three denarii. Here's three denarii. Go to the temple, to the bank, exchange this three denarii for one shekel because that, was, that would be the equivalent exchange rate unless they pushed it up to four denarii that day because they could do whatever they want, right? If you need the shekel. He never sent them to the money changers because Jesus always worked outside of the system of men supernaturally. So that's what I'm telling you. We, the church, have to learn to work outside of the system in these last days. We have to. That's why I'm always talking about being out of the box, outside of the system of man, outside of the world system. Don't attach yourself to the world system. God's got a better way. There's a more excellent way. There's a, there's a divine way to go about doing things, but you need to have a divine strategy from heaven because when God gives you a word, then there's the strategy, and now you put that strategy into practice, then now you see supernatural results. So how will this wealth transfer come into the hands of of God's people this wicked wealth that has been created right because all the money all the gold and the silver which are real commodities are gone they're in Switzerland that's why Switzerland's always neutral and there everyone in Switzerland is armed from top to bottom and they're heavily trained they have all kinds of you know firearms and everything do you understand me why do you think Swiss banks everybody's got money in the Swiss banks Cayman Islands and Swiss banks, the two places where they hide the money. So all the gold is gone because it was confiscated. And of course, in the Nixon shock of 1973, when the gold was finally done away with, there was no more money that's backed by real commodity. What we have today is it called a Federal Reserve note. It's an IOU. Did you guys ever do IOUs when you were kids? I would borrow, hey, can I borrow a, a one lira, Turkish lira? I went to go buy a, a Turkish simit, which is like a bagel, like a sesame bagel. And my friend would write and say, write me an IOU. And I, have you ever done that? Who's, who's ever done that? I guess my generation did it. Kids today, they have no clue, but maybe you do Cash App or something. But we didn't have Cash App or Venmo, you know. But literally, we would, and, I, and I'd give him an IOU, and I'd come home, Dad, I needed one lira. I, I, I owe my, my friend because I bought, you know. <laughs> so so he, I give him the money, he give me the IOU back. That's really what a Federal Reserve note is today. It's fiat money. And the interesting thing about fiat, fiat is a Latin word which means let there be. It's not a car brand. It means let there be. So fiat money means let there be money. In other words, they create money out of thin air. Somebody presses a button, Federal Reserve prints more money. They don't actually print it because only about 3% of the money is actually in cash form. And you know they want to do cash, right? They want to do away with cash. Because why? Cash is what? More, more power in the hands of the people because you can hold your cash. If it's digital, they can shut it down. If you've been a bad boy, you posted something, you got taken down on YouTube, we're going to freeze your bank account. They're already doing this in China. See, we have a credit score here. Then there's also a citizen score now in China. They monitor you, and that's where the globalist establishment will be. It's all full-on surveillance, monitoring everybody's actions, activities, and de determining. That's why they have to have digital currencies, because it's programmable money. That's why they're pushing central bank digital currencies and do away with the Federal Reserve notes. Because you can't have money in cash that you can hide somewhere anymore. And they've been limiting it more and more anymore. I mean, you can't even travel with more than $10,000 on you. If they find it, they'll confiscate it. And then you have to go to court and prove where the money came from. And it could be years and your money's gone. That's why if you're ever flying or driving around, you should not have $10,000 on you in cash. If they've search you which they shouldn't be illegally but they'll confiscate the money and i've gone through this in turkey we were having all kinds of economic crisis and all the atms were shut down all you could get was a hundred dollars a day so you could have a million dollars in the account you, you can't even get it anyways that's what's called a bank run right 
They create this crisis. Everybody runs to the bank to get cash, but there's not enough cash. It's called a bank run. That's how they triggered all the crashes of 1907 and, and, and two, you know, 1929. And so people run to the bank to get cash because of fear, right? They run to, to the grocery store to get toilet papers because there's a virus. They run to the grocery store to get, uh, you know, a bunch of ultra processed crappy food because there's a hurricane coming. They run, you know, they're running everywhere, right? They're running, running, uh, fear. It's all driven by fear. That's why I'm trying to always get you guys to be in faith, not fear. Because fear, see, people that are afraid and in fear are, can easily be controlled and manipulated. So it's not even, it was never even about a virus. It was about a fear. Spirit of fear was the real virus, right? So fear is how they will manipulate and control. That's why we have to be in faith. Because when we're in faith, we can get a word from God and we can supersede the situation and the environment. We can operate outside of the system. So the Lord spoke to me, I will shake the nations one more time. I will overturn the money changers tables, which is the system, right? So now we have this fiat money, which is based on fractional reserve banking, right? So we need more money. Okay, Federal Reserve says, that's fine. We'll create more money. Guess what happens to money? It gets devalued. That's why a car that was $700 50 years ago is now $70,000. But it's really actually the same amount of money. Because people didn't earn $70,000. They earned 1000 or $700. But the money keeps getting more and more devalued. So we need more and more of it. So the money... Money supply just keeps growing, the volume keeps growing, 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 but the buying power keeps dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. And that's what happened over the last four years of the Biden administration with the superinflation that we've had. We've had 40% inflation here in the United States of America. The things that you used to spend $100 on to fill your grocery card, now you're going to spend $200 over, over $200, $250. Why? Because it's inflation. It's manipulation. Oh, well, we don't know how this happened. Yeah, you know exactly how it happened. Your money masters that you work for orchestrated it. Don't lie to me, you lying devil. See, I know. So I just look at him, I laugh. I know you lying devil. And the people are so duped because they come out of public school education. They have no clue. They go, oh, yeah, 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 it's the war and it's this and yeah, yeah, it was the virus. Yeah, 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 it's the supply chain problems. It's the ports, you know, they're, you know, yeah, yeah, it's the truckers. Yeah, it's all lies. It's all a facade. It's all a smoke screen. It's always about the money, right? Trace the money, the money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Murders, wars, assassinations, and overthrows of governments, and everything comes down to the love of money. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? So I'm speaking to you prophetically because the Lord showed this to me in 2010. So these money changers... And what we have today, the Federal Reserve, which is again, I said a private bank. They just create money and then you have all the member banks, right? You know, Bank of America and Wells Fargo. I think that they've been, they're always buying up banks. Bank of America, I think, has bought up over 200 banks now. See, everything's starting to become a conglomerate and it's dwindling. And so now you've got the five big banks. These are all member banks of the Federal Reserve. So they get a portion of the money that's been created, which becomes their reserve. And it's a fractional reserve. So whatever they have in reserve, they can loan out up to 10 times, but on paper, but they've been doing it up to 80 times. So the Federal Reserve creates fiat money, money out of nothing, right? See, God said, let there be light. And that was like, they say, let there be money and there's money. And then they take the money out of nothing Give it to banks who create more money out of nothing. But what about all those subprime lo loans that they gave out? All those people got loans in the 2000s and people couldn't pay them. It was to their advantage. They knew people couldn't pay them. 
That's why they took out derivatives, which is an insurance on the side that you can't pay the loan. So if you don't pay the loan, they make money off of the derivative. And then they come and dispossess you of the actual physical commodity, which is called home and kick you out on the street. Now they got double paid. This is how wicked and evil this system is. See how I'm getting all stirred up because I know so much. I guess that's why I want to make a whip. That's why I tell people, if you knew what I knew, thank God you don't because you wouldn't be able to know what to do with it. Without the anointing, you just go kill people. You chop off, start chopping off ears and stuff, you know. But with the anointing now that you know, because you know, people say, well, okay, I have all this information. What do I do now? You need to have, you need to pray and know what your part is. First and foremost, you can't love money. You have to love God. You, can't, you can only serve one of two masters. See, in the world system, money is the master. Here in the house of God, in the kingdom of God, Jesus is our master. That's why you got to serve him. You got to tithe. You got to give. You got to serve him. You got to do what he tells you to do. And you have to get greed and love of money and all fear and every attachment to, to earthly treasure out of your heart so that God can actually use you to be a part of this end time blessing, end time move of supernatural prosperity that he's going to release so that we can get the job done. See, we need the anointing, which is supernatural equipment to get the job done. And then we need the money. So there's a prophesied end time harvest, which is twofold, right? The upper and the lower springs. Upper and the lower springs. Put, oh, sorry, yeah, they're not even, Upper and the lower springs to do two streams. One stream is the upper, the financial. One stream is the lower, the anointing. That's where this comes from. I prophesied this in 2010. That's where this comes from. So there's going to be a release, a, a, a spiritual harvest of souls, and there's going to be a material harvest because we're going to need both. And it's going to be a quick work. It's not going to be a long work. It's going to be a quick work. We're going to, get, we're going to do this so fast just like Jesus went in there and just pssst, went through that place like a storm. God's going to move through like a storm and it's going to shake up everything. And we're going to bring in the greatest harvest of souls. And then we're going to get the heaven out of here. That's why seed time and harvest time is so important. Because they're also sowing seed. Seeds of wickedness and corruption and lies and deceit. And it's going to come back to them pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will settle accounts. He's no man's debtor and God's not a liar. He's not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man who should repent. Yes. 